Cupid from Bear Creek by Robert Howard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cupid from Bear Creek by Robert Howard. Some day, maybe, when I'm an old man, I'll have sense enough to stay away from these new mining camps which springs up overnight like mushroomers. There was that time in Teton Gulch, for example. It was an ill-advised moment when I stopped there on my way back to the Humboldts from the Yavapai country. I was a sheep for the shearing, and I was sure plenty. And if some of the shearers got fatally hurt in the process, they needn't to blame me. I was acting in self-defense all the way through. At first I aimed to pass right through Teton Gulch without stopping. I was in a hurry to get back to my home country and find out was any misguided idiots trying to court Dolly Rixby, the belle of war paint, in my absence. I hadn't heard from her since I left Bear Creek five weeks before, which weren't surprising, seeing as how she couldn't write, nor none of her family and I couldn't have read it if they had. But there was a lot of young bucks around war paint which could be counted on to start shining rounder the minute my back was turned. But my thirst got the best of me, and I stopped in the camp. I was drinking me a dram at the bar of the Yeller Dog Saloon and Hotel, when the barkeep says, after studying me a spell, he says, You must be Breckenridge Elkins. Of Bear Creek. I give the matter due consideration, and loud as how I was. How come you knowed me? I inquired suspiciously, cause I had never been in Teton Gulch before. And he says, Well, I heard tell of Breckenridge Elkins, and when I seen you, I figured you must be him, because I don't see how they can be two men in the world that big. By the way, there's a friend of yourn upstairs. Blink Wiltshaw from War Paint. I've heard him brag about knowing you personal. He's upstairs now, fourth door from the stairhead, on the left. Now that there news interested me, because Blink was the most persistent of all them young mavericks which was trying to spark Dolly Rixby. Just the night before I left for Yavapai, I catched him coming out of her house and was fixin' to sweep the street with him when Dolly came out and stopped me, and made us shake hands. It suited me fine for him to be in Teton Gulch, or anywheres, just so he weren't nowheres nigh Dolly Rixby, so I thought I'd pass the time of day with him. I went upstairs and knocked on the door, and BAM went a gun inside, and a forty-five slug gripped through the door and taken a nick out of my off ear. Getting shot in the ear always did irritate me, so without waiting for no more demonstrations of hospitality, I give voice to my displeasure in a deafening beller, and knocked the door off its hinges and busted into the room over its ruins. For a second I didn't see nobody, but then I heard a kind of gurgle going on, and happened to remember that the door seemed kind of squishy underfoot when I tromped over it so I knowed that whoever was in the room had got pinned under the door when I knocked it down. So I reached under it and got him by the collar and hauled him out. Sure enough, it was Blink Wiltshaw. He was limp as a lariat and glassy-eyed and pale, and was still kind of trying to shoot me with a six-shooter when I'd taken it away from him. "'What the hell's the matter with you?' I demanded sternly, dangling him by the collar with one hand, whilst shaking him till his teeth rattled. Didn't Dolly make us shake hands? What you mean trying to assassinate me through a hotel door? Let me down, Breck, he gasped. I didn't know it was you. I thought it was Rattlesnake Harrison coming after my gold. So I sawed him down. He grabbed a jug of liquor and taken a swig, and his hand shook so he spilled half of it down his neck. Well, I demanded, ain't you going to offer me a snort, durn it? Excuse me, Breckenridge, he apologized. I'm so durn jumpy I don't know what I'm doing. 
"'You see them buckskin folks?' he said, pointing to some bags on the bed. "'Them is plumb full of nuggets. I've been mining up the gulch, and I hit a regular bonanza the first week. But it ain't doing me no good.' "'What you mean?' I demanded. "'These mountains is full of outlaws,' says he. "'They robs and murders every man which makes a strike. "'The stagecoach has been stuck up so often "'nobody sends their dust out on it no more. "'When a man makes a pile, "'he sneaks out through the mountains at night "'with his gold on pack mules. "'I aimed to do that last night, "'but them outlaws has got spies all over the camp, "'and I know they got me spotted.' "'Rattlesnake Harrison's their chief, and he's a ring-tailed he-devil. "'I've been squatting over this here gold with my pistol in fear and trembling, "'expecting them to come right into camp after me. "'I'm dern nigh loco.' "'And he shivered and cussed kind of whimpery and taken another dram "'and cocked his pistol and sat there, shaking like he'd seen a ghost or two. "'You gotta help me, Breckenridge,' he said desperately. You take this here gold out for me, will you? The outlaws don't know you. You could hit the old Injun path south of the camp and follow to Hell Wind Pass. The Chaudier Wapitan stage goes through there about sundown. You could put the gold on the stage there and they'd take it on to Wapitan. Harrison wouldn't never think of holding it up after it left Hell Wind. They always holds it up this side of the pass. "'What I want to risk my neck for you for?' I demanded bitterly, memories of Dolly Rixby rising up before me. "'If you ain't got the guts to tote out your own gold.' "'Tain't altogether the gold, Breck,' says he. "'I'm trying to get married and—' "'Married,' says I. "'Here? In Teton Gulch? To a gal in Teton Gulch?' "'Married to a gal in Teton Gulch,' he avowed. I was aiming to get hitched tomorrow, but there ain't a preacher or justice of a peace in camp to tie the knot. But her uncle, the Reverend Rembrandt Brockton, is a circuit rider, and he's due to pass through hell wind on his way to Wapiton today. I was aiming to sneak out last night, hide in the hills till the stage come through, then put the gold on the stage and bring Brother Rembrandt back with me. But yesterday... I learned Harrison's spies was watching me, and I'm scared to go. Now Brother Rembrandt will go on to Wapit, not knowing he's needed here, and no telling when I'll be able to get married. Hold on, I said hurriedly, doing some quick thinking. I didn't want this here wedding to fall through. The more Blink was married to some gal in Teton, the less he could marry Dolly Rixby. Blink, I said, grasping his hand warmly. Let it never be said that an Elkins ever turned down a friend in distress. I'll take your gold to Hellwind Pass and bring back Brother Rembrandt. Blink fell onto my neck and wept with joy. I'll never forget this, Breckenridge, says he, and I bet you won't neither. My hoss and pack mule are in the stables behind the saloon. I don't need no pack mule, I says. Captain Kidd can pack the dust easy. Captain Kidd was getting fed out in the corral next to the hotel. I went out there and got my saddlebags, which is a lot bigger than most saddlebags, because all of my plunder has to be made to fit my size. They're made out of three-ply elk skin, stitched with rawhide thongs, and a wildcat couldn't claw his way out of them. I noticed quite a bunch of men standing around the corral looking at Captain Kidd, but thought nothing of it because he is a hoss which naturally attracts attention. But whilst I was getting my saddlebags, a long, lanky cuss with long, yaller whiskers come up and says, says he, Is that your hoss in the corral? If he ain't, he ain't nobody's, I says. Well, he looks a whole lot like a hoss that was stole off my ranch six months ago, he said. And I seen ten or twelve hard-looking hombres gathering round me. I laid down my saddlebag sudden-like and reached for my guns when it occurred to me that if I had a fight there I might get arrested and it would interfere with me bringing Brother Rembrandt in for the wedding. If that there is your hoss, I said, you ought to be able to lead him out of that there corral. 
Sure I can, he says with an oath. And what's more, I aim to. He looked at me suspiciously, but he'd taken up a rope and clung the fence and started toward Captain Kidd, which was chawing on a block of hay in the middle of the corral. Captain Kidd throwed up his head and laid back his ears and showed his teeth, and Jake stopped sudden and turned pale. Ah, uh, I don't believe that there is my hoss after all, says he. Put that lasso on him, I roared, pulling my right hand gun. You say he's yourn, I say he's mine. One of us is a liar and a hoss thief, and I aim to prove which. Go on, before I festoon your system with lead polka dots. He looked at me, and he looked at Captain Kidd, and he turned bright green all over. He looked again at my forty-five, which I now had cocked and punted at his long neck, which his Adam's apple was going up and down like a monkey on a pole. And he began to edge toward Captain Kidd again, holding the rope behind him and sticking out one hand. Whoa, boy, he said, kind of shudderingly. Whoa, good old feller, nice hossy. Whoa, boy, ow! He let out a awful howl as Captain Kidd made a snap and bit a chunk out of his hide. He turned to run, but Captain Kidd wheeled and let fly with both heels, which caught Jake in the seat of the britches, and his shriek of despair was horrible to hear as he went head first through the corral fence into a hoss trough on the other side. From this he ariz, dripping water, blood, and profanity, and he shook a quivering fist at me and croaked, You turn murderer! I'll have your life for this! I don't hold no conversation with hoss thieves, I snorted, and picked up my saddlebags and stalked through the crowd which gave back in a hurry. I'd taken the saddlebags up to Blink's room and told him about Jake, thinking he'd be amused, but got a case of aggers again, and said, That was one of Harrison's men. He meant to take your hoss. It's an old trick, and honest folks don't dare interfere. Now they got you spotted. What'll you do? Time tied and a Elkins waits for no man, I snorted, dumping the gold into the saddlebags. If that yeller whiskered coyote wants any trouble, he can get a belly full. Don't worry, your gold will be safe in my saddlebags. It's as good as in the Wapitan stage right now. And by midnight, I'll be back with brother Rembrandt Brockton to hit you up with his niece. Oh, don't yell so loud, begged Blink. The cussed camp's full of spies. Some of them may be downstairs now, listening. I weren't speaking above a whisper, I said indignantly. That bull's beller may pass for a whisper on Bear Creek, says he, wiping off the sweat. But I bet they can hear it from one end of the gulch to the other, at least. It's a pitiful sight to see a man with a case of the skirts. I shook hands with him and left him, pouring red liquor down his gullet like it was water, and I swung the saddlebags over my shoulder and went downstairs. The barkeep leaned over the bar and whispered to me, Look out for Jake Roman. He was in here a minute ago looking for trouble. He pulled out just before you come down, but he won't be forgetting what your hoss done to him. Not when he tries to set down, he won't, I agreed and went on out to the corral, and there was a crowd of men watching Captain Kidd eat his hay. One of them seen me and hollered, Hey, boys, here comes the giant. He's going to saddle that man-eating monster. Hey, Bill, tell the boys at the bar. And here come a whole passel of fellers running out of all the saloons, and they lined the corral fence solid, started laying bets whether I'd get the saddle on Captain Kidd, or get my brains kicked out. I thought miners must all be crazy. They ought to have knowed I was able to saddle my own hoss. Well, I saddled him, throwed on the saddlebags, and clumb aboard. He pitched about ten jumps, like he always does when I first fork him. Tornt nothing, but them miners hollered like wild engines. And when he accidentally bucked himself and me through the fence and knocked down a section of it, along with fifteen men which was settin' on the top rail, 
The way they howled, you'd have thought something terrible had happened. Me and Captain Kidd don't generally bother about gates. We usually makes our own through whatever happens to be in front of us. But them miners is a weakly breed, because as I rode out of town I seen the crowd dipping four or five of them in a hoss trough to bring them to, on account of Captain Kidd having accidentally tromped on them. Well, I rode out of the gulch and up the ravine to the south, and come out into the high timbered country and hit the old engine trail Blink had told me about. It weren't traveled much. I didn't meet nobody after I left the gulch. I figured to hit Hellwind Pass at least an hour before sundown, which would give me plenty of time. Blink said the stage passed through there about sundown. I'd have to bring back Brother Rembrandt on Captain Kidd, I reckon, but that there hoss can carry double and still, outrun and outlast, any other hoss in the state of Nevada. I figured on getting back to Teton about midnight or a little later. After I'd went several miles, I'd come to Apache Canyon, which was a deep, narrow gorge, with a river at the bottom which went roaring and foaming along betwixt rock walls a hundred and fifty feet high. The old trail hit the rim at a place where the canyon weren't only about seventy foot wide, and somebody'd felled a whoppin' big pine tree on one side, so it fell across and made a footbridge where a man could walk across. They'd once been a gold strike in Apache Canyon and a big camp there, but now it was plumb abandoned, and nobody lived anywheres near it. I turned east and followed the rim for about half a mile. Here I came onto an old wagon road, which was just about growed up with saplings now, but it run down into a ravine into the bed of the canyon, and there was a bridge across the river which had been built during the days of the gold rush. Most of it had been washed away by head rises, but a man could still ride a horse across what was left. So I'd done so and rode up a ravine on the other side and come out on the high ground again. I'd rode a few hundred yards past the ravine, when somebody said, Hey! And I wheeled with both guns in my hands. Out of the brash sattered a tall gent in a long frock coat and broad-brimmed hat. Who are you and what the hell you mean by hollering, Hey! at me, I demanded courteously, pointing my guns at him. And Elkins is always polite. I am the Reverend Rembrandt Brockton, my good man, says he. I am on my way to Teton Gulch to unite my niece and a young man of that camp in the bonds of holy matrimony. The he You don't say, I says. A foot? I alit from the stagecoach at, uh, Hades Wind Pass, says he. Some very agreeable cowboys happened to be awaiting the stage there, and they offered to escort me to Teton. How come you knowed your niece was wantin' to be united in acrimony? I asked. The cowboys informed me that such was the case, said he. Whereat are they now, I next inquire. The mount with which they supplied me went lame a little while ago, says he. They left me here while they went to procure another from a nearby ranch house. I don't know who'd have a ranch anywheres near here, I muttered. They ain't got much sense leaving you here by your high lonesome. You mean to imply there is danger, says he, blinking mildly at me. These here mountains is lousy with outlaws, which would as soon carve a preacher's gullet as anybody's, I said. And then I thought of something else. Hey, I says, I thought the stage didn't come through the pass till sundown. Such was the case, says he, but the schedule has been altered. Heck, I says, I was aiming to put this here gold on it which my saddlebags is full of. Now I'll have to take it back to Teton with me. Well, I'll bring it out tomorrow and catch the stage then. Brother Rembrandt, I'm Breckenridge Elkins of Bear Creek, and I come out here to meet you and escort you back to this gulch so's you could unite your niece and blink wiltshaw in the holy bounds of alimony come on we'll ride double but i must await my cowboy friends he said ah here they come now 
I looked over to the east and seen about fifteen men ride into sight out of the brush and move toward us. One was leading a hoss without no saddle on to it. Ah, my good friends, beamed the brother Rembrandt. They have procured a mount for me, even as they promised. He hauled a saddle out of the brush and says, Would you please saddle my horse for me when they get here? I should be delighted to hold your rifle while you did so. I started a handy my Winchester when the snap of a twig under a hoss's hoof made me whirl quick. A feller had just rode out of a thicket about a hundred yards south of me, and he was raising a Winchester to his shoulder. I recognized him instantly. If us Bear Creek folks didn't have eyes like a hawk, we'd never live to get growed. It was Jake Roman. Our Winchesters banged together. His lead fanned my ear, and mine knocked him endwise out of his saddle. Cowboys, hell, I roared. Them's Harrison's outlaws. I'll save you, brother Rembrandt. I swooped him up with one arm and gouged Captain Kidd with the spurs, and he went from there like a thunderbolt with its tail on fire. Them outlaws come on with wild yells. I ain't in the habit of running from people, but I was afeard they might do the reverent harm if it come to a close fight, and if he stopped a hunk of lead, Blink might not get to marry his niece, and might get disgusted and go back to war paint and start sparkin' Dolly Rixby again. I was heading back for the canyon, aimin' to make a stand in the ravine if I had to, and them outlaws was killin' their hosses trying to get to the bend of the trail ahead of me and cut me off. Captain Kidd was runnin' with his belly to the ground, but I'll admit Brother Rembrandt weren't helpin' me much. He was layin' across my saddle with his arms and legs wavin' wildly, because I hadn't had time to set him comfortable. And when the horn jobbed him in the belly, he uttered some words I wouldn't have expected to hear spoke by a minister of the gospel. Guns began to crack, and lead hummed past us and Brother Rembrandt twisted his head around and screamed, Stop that shooting, you sons of... You'll hit me! I thought it was kind of selfish of Brother Rembrandt not to mention me too, but I said, Tain't no use to remonstrate with them skunks, Reverend. They ain't got no respect for a preacher even. But to my amazement the shooting stopped, though them bandits yelled louder than ever and flogged their cayuses. But about that time I seen they had me cut off from the lower canyon crossing, so I wrenched Captain Kidd into the old engine trace and headed straight for that canyon rim as hard as he could hammer, with the brush lashing and snapping round us and slapping Brother Rembrandt in the face when it whipped back. The outlaws yelled and wheeled in behind us, but Captain Kidd drawed away from them with every stride, and the canyon rim loomed just ahead of us. "'Pull up, ye jack-eared son of Belial!' howled Brother Rembrandt. "'You'll go over the edge.' "'Be at ease, Reverend,' I reassured him. "'We're going over the log.' "'Lord, have mercy on my soul!' he squalled, and shut his eyes and grabbed the strip leather with both hands. Then Captain Kidd went over that log like thunder rolling on Judgment Day." I doubt if there's another hoss west of the Pegasus, which would bolt out onto a log footbridge across a canyon a hundred and fifty foot deep like that. But they ain't nothing in this world Captain Kidd scared of, except maybe me. He didn't slacken his speed none. He streaked across that log like it was a quarter track, with the bark and splinters flying from under his hooves, and if one foot had slipped an inch, it would have been Sally bar the door. But he didn't slip, and we was over and on the other side almost before you could catch your breath. You can open your eyes now, Brother Rembrandt, I said kindly, but he didn't say nothing. He'd fainted. I shook him to wake him up, and in a flash he come to and give a shriek and grabbed my leg like a bar trap. I reckon he thought we was still on the log. I was trying to pry him loose when Captain Kidd chose that moment to run under a low-hanging oak tree limb. That's his idea of a joke. That there hoss has got a great sense of humor. 
I looked up just in time to see the limb coming, but not in time to dodge it. It was as big around as my thigh, and it took me smack across the wishbone. We was going full speed, and something had to give way. It was the girths, both of them. Captain Kidd went out from under me, and me and Brother Rembrandt and the saddle hit the ground together. I jumped up, but Brother Rembrandt laid there going, woog, 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 like water running out of a busted jug. And then I seen them outlaws had dismounted off their hosses and was corning across the bridge single file with their Winchesters in their hands. I didn't waste no time shooting them misguided idiots. I run to the end of the footbridge, ignoring the slugs they slung at me. It was pretty poor shooting because they weren't sure of their footing and didn't aim good. So I only got one bullet in the hind leg and was creased three or four other unimportant places. Not enough to worry about. I bent my knees and got hold of the end of the log and heaved up with it. Them outlaws hollered and fell along it like tin pins and dropped their Winchesters and grabbed hold of the log. I given it a shake and shook some of them off like persimmons off a limb after a frost, and then I swung the butt around clear of the rim and let go. And it went down, end over end, into the river, a hundred and fifty feet below, with a dozen men still hanging on to it and yelling blue murder. A regular geyser of water splashed up when they hit, and the last I seen of them they was all swirling down the river together in a thrashing tangle of arms and legs and heads. I remembered Brother Rembrandt and run back to where he'd fell, but was already on to his feet. He was kind of pale and wild-eyed, and his legs kept bending under him, but he had hold of the saddlebags and was trying to drag him into a thicket, mumbling kind of dizzily to himself. "'It's all right now, Brother Rembrandt,' I said kindly. "'Them outlaws is plumb horse de combat now, as the French say. Blink's gold is safe.' "'Blink,' says Brother Rembrandt, pulling two guns from under his coattails and if I hadn't have grabbed him, he would have undoubtedly shot me. We wrestled round, and I protested. Hold on, Brother Rembrandt. I ain't no outlaw. I'm your friend, Breckenridge Elkins. Don't you remember? His only reply was a promise to eat my heart without no seasoning. Then he sunk his teeth into my ear and started to chaw it off, whilst gouging for my eyes with both thumbs and spurring me severely in the hind legs. I seen he was out of his head from fright and the fall he got, so I said sorrowfully, Brother Rembrandt, I hate to do this. It hurts me more than it does you, but we can't waste time like this. Blink is waiting to get married. And with a sigh, I busted him over the head with the butt of my six-shooter, and he fell over and twitched a few times, and then lay limp. Poor Brother Rembrandt, I sighed sadly. All I hope is I ain't addled your brain so you forgot the wedding ceremony. So as to not have no more trouble with him when, and if he come to, I'd tied his arms and legs with pieces of malaria and taken his weapons, which was most surprising arms for a circuit rider. His pistols had the triggers out of them, and they was three notches on the butt of one and four on the other. Moreover, he had a buoy knife in his boot, and a deck of marked cards and a pair of loaded dice in his hip pocket. But that weren't none of my business. About the time I finished tying him up, Captain Kidd come back to see if he'd killed me or just crippled me for life. To show him I can take a joke, too, I'd give him a kick in the belly, and when he could get his breath again and undouble himself, I throwed the saddle on him. I spliced the girths with the rest of my lariat and put Brother Rembrandt in the saddle, and clumb on behind, and we headed for Teton Gulch. After an hour or so, Brother Rembrandt come to and says kind of dizzily, "'Was anyone saved from the typhoon?' "'You're all right, Brother Rembrandt,' I assured him. "'I'm taking you to Teton Gulch.' "'I remember,' he muttered. "'It all comes back to me. Damn Jake Roman! I thought it was a good idea, but it seems I was mistaken.' I thought we had an ordinary human being to deal with. I know when I'm licked. I'll give you a thousand dollars to let me go. 
Take it easy, Brother Rembrandt, I soothed, seeing he was still delirious. We'll be in Teton in no time. I don't want to go to Teton, he hollered. You got to, I said. You got to unite your niece and Blink Wiltshaw in the holy buns of parsimony. To hell with Blink Wiltshaw and my niece, he yelled. You ought to be ashamed using such language, and you a minister of the gospel, I reproved him sternly. His reply would have curled up Paiute's hair. I was so scandalized I made no reply. I was just fixin' to untie him so's he could ride more comfortable, but I thought if he was that crazy I better not. So I give no heed to his ravens, which growed more and more unbearable. In all my born days I never seen such a preacher. It was sure a relief to me to sight Teton at last. It was night when we rode down the ravine into the gulch, and the dance halls and saloons was going full blast. I rode up behind the Yaller Dog Saloon and hauled Brother Rembrandt off with me, and sought him on his feet, and he said, kind of despairingly, For the last time, listen to reason. I got fifty thousand dollars cashed up in the hills. I'll give you every cent if you'll untie me. I don't want no money, I said. All I want is for you to marry your niece and blink Wiltshaw. I'll untie you then. All right, he said, all right, but untie me now. I was just fixin' to do it when the barkeep come out with a lantern, and he shone it on our faces and said in a startled tone, Who the hell is that with you, Elkins? You wouldn't never suspect it from his language, I says, but it's the Reverend Rembrandt Brockton. Are you crazy, says the barkeep? That's Rattlesnake Harrison. I give up, said my prisoner. I'm Harrison. I'm licked. Lock me up somewhere, away from this lunatic. I was standing in a kind of daze with my mouth open, but now I woke up and bellered, What? You're Harrison? I see it all now. Jake Roman overheard me talking to Blink Wiltshaw, and rode off and fixed it with you to fool me like you done, so's to get Blink's gold. That's why you wanted to hold my Winchester whilst I saddled your cayuse. How'd you ever guess, he sneered. We ought to a shot you from ambush like I wanted to. But Jake wanted to catch you alive and torture you to death, count of your horse biting him. The fool must have lost his head at the last minute and decided to shoot you after all. If you hadn't recognized him... We'd had you surrounded and stuck up before you knew what was happening. But now the real preacher's gone on to Wapiton, I hollered. I gotta foller him and bring him back. Why, he's here, said one of the men, which was gathering round us. He come in with his niece an hour ago on the stage from war paint. War paint, I howled, hit in the belly by a premonition. I run into the saloon where there was a lot of people, and there was Blink and a gal holding hands in front of an old man with a long white beard, and he had a book in his hand and t'other lifted in the air. He was saying, And I now pronounces you all man and wife, them which God hath joined together, let no snake hunter put asunder. Dolly, I yelled. Both of them jumped about four foot and whirled, and Dolly Rixby jumped in front of Blink and spread her arms like she was shooing chickens. "'Don't you tetch him, Breckenridge Elkins!' she hollered. "'I just married him, and I don't aim for no humble grizzly to spile him.' "'But I don't savvy all this,' I said dizzily, nervously fumbling with my guns, which is a habit of mine when upsot. Everybody in the wedding party started ducking out a line." and Blink said hurriedly, "'It's this way, Breck. When I made my pile so unexpectedly quick, I sent for Dolly to come and marry me like she'd promised the day after you left for Yavapai. I was aiming to take my gold out today, like I told you, so me and Dolly could go on to San Francisco on our honeymoon, but I learned Harrison's gang was watching me, just like I told you. I wanted to get my gold out, and I wanted to get you out of the way before Dolly and her uncle got here on the war paint stage. 
So I told you that lie about Brother Rembrandt being on the Wapiton stage. It was the only lie. You said you was marrying a gal in Teton, I accused fiercely. Well, says he, I did marry her in Teton. You know, Breck, all's fair in love and war. Now, now, boys, said Brother Rembrandt, the real one, I mean. The gal's married, your rivalry is over, and they's no use holding grudges. Shake hands and be friends. All right, I said heavily. No man can't say I ain't a good loser. I was cut deep, but I concealed my busted heart. Leastwise, I concealed it all I was able to. Them folks which says I crippled Blink Wiltshaw with malice aforethought is liars, which I'll sweep the road with when I catches em. When my emotions is wrought up, I unconsciously uses more of my strength than I realizes. I didn't aim to break Blink's arm when I shook hands with him. It was just the stress of my emotions. Likewise, it was Dolly's fault that her uncle Rembrandt got throwed out a winder and some others got their heads banged. When she busted me with that cuspidor, I knew that our love was dead forever. Tears come into my eyes as I waded through the crowd, and I had to move fast to keep from making a fool of myself. Them that was flaying out of my way ought to have knowed it was done more in sorrow than in anger. End of Cupid from Bear Creek